Hey guys, usually when I talk about improvement, I'm talking about F2L. And of course that's because F2L is the place where most people have the most room to improve. But let's not forget about the last layer. So today we're talking about tips to improve in the last layer all the way from beginner tips up to some of the most advanced things that I can think of. Number one, learn all of the algorithms. For OLL, there are 57 algorithms. And then for PLL, there are 21 algorithms. That adds to a total of 78 algorithms, which some people don't want to learn at first. Of course, it is a lot. So instead, what you can do is learn 2-look OLL and 2-look PLL, which gives a total of 16 algorithms, and it can actually solve the cube pretty fast. After learning this, you want to learn full PLL, which is 21 algorithms, which is not so bad. And then I find that many people don't want to learn full OLL at first because 57 sounds like a lot but a lot of them are really similar to each other or they're really short and people just end up learning it anyway because they found it wasn't as hard as they expected it to be. Number two, increase turn speed. A common tip you'll hear for practicing last layer is to drill your algorithms, which just means do them really, really fast. And I know that a lot of people find this to be boring and it is a little bit boring, of course, because you're not doing an actual solve, but if you just turn it into a game of how fast you can do certain algorithms, then maybe it'll be more fun that way. All right, let's be honest, that isn't fun for everybody, but I know what is fun for everybody is just picking up a cube and doing random algorithms on them. So I know I do that a lot and doing it at this speed or a speed that's comfortable for me is not necessarily going to improve my turn speed because I'm already pretty good at turning it at that speed. So instead, if you find yourself picking up the cube and doing random turns, maybe you should just do an algorithm as fast as you can. And then you'll find that you, you start to mess up more often. That's because, of course, you're not very good at turning it at the fastest speed possible. But if you just keep doing that, you'll end up being able to turn faster and faster. So when I first started drilling algorithms, I remember I could not get any algorithm to be under one second. And I was averaging about 15 seconds or so. And now I would say about half of my algorithms can consistently be under one second. So when you do your algorithms as fast as you can, you may find that there are times when you can't go any faster, but it seems like it's not very fast at all. And that often is because of the way you do the algorithm. Number three, find better ways to do the algorithms. For example, this U permutation. How I always did this algorithm was like this. So no matter how much you drill certain algorithms, unless you find better finger tricks, they're not going to get much better. And so you generally want to find finger tricks that will reduce the number of regrips. So there are many ways you can do this algorithm, but one way I like to do it is like this. And then regrip once. So if you do it that way, you can end up executing it a lot faster. So another example of an unnecessary regrip is in this algorithm where I used to go like this. But there's actually two good ways to solve this case that do not involve moving your thumb to the bottom to start. And the first one is just doing U2 with the other hand so you don't have to regrip here, which goes like this. Another good way to do the algorithm is by instead doing this angle here and doing it like this. And this one also starts and ends with the thumb on the front and also has no regrips in the middle. Now the last thing is picking algorithms that are not risky to do. For example, gperms, I use the rud versions and I don't use the wide move versions even though I think they're pretty much just as fast and that's because the rotation and the wide moves make it very difficult to do consistently. And the last little group of algorithms I changed for low risk is the uperms, which you could do with r and u, which is also good for big cubes, but on three by three, I prefer to use m and u moves. I find them to be lower risk because I don't move my hands as much and there's no regrips. So I tend to be able to do them more consistently. Number four, faster recognition. For OLL especially, you can always recognize just by looking at two sides and the top. So in this case, this corner sticker faces outwards. So that means this corner sticker also faces outwards. So um, that's the case. So typically people recognize this by the fact that there's an L on top and these little blocks here, but you don't actually have to see that block to deduce what that must look like. This idea of looking at two sides also works for PLL, but it is a lot harder sometimes. But here are some tricks you should look out for. So here I see blue, red, blue, red. And if you see this pattern, then you should know that over here, there's a block and this is a G perm. So this is what I call a checker pattern of four stickers. But if you have a checker pattern of five stickers, orange, green, orange, green, orange, then this one is the R perm. Here we have what looks like an H perm besides one sticker. So if we covered up this one, it would look like we have that swap of these two and these two. So if that's the case, then you have this G perm here. 
So these tend to be cases that are hard to recognize from certain angles, but if you just find things like this, then it can be a lot easier. And this G-perm actually has a nice pattern on the other side as well if you don't see the block, and that is green, blue, green, green, blue. So the only sticker right here in the middle, if you cover that, everything is like opposites of each other. So green and blue are opposite colors. So if I see that with just one here, then I know the block is over here and that's a G-perm. And can you tell which one is Y-perm and which one is V-perm? So this one has the checkers on the outside, so this one is Y-perm. This one has the checkers on the inside, so this one is V-perm. However, this sort of recognition is not perfect. You can't just look at the four in the middle, you have to look at the outsides as well. And so these two on the outsides are different, but what if they were the same, like in this one? So they both have the four sticker checker pattern in the middle here, but then this one with the same ones on the outside is an F perm, and this one is the V perm. So there's a bit of a problem here in that it's kind of hard to recognize because you have to look at every single sticker, and that takes a long time during a solve. So recognition can be really hard. Uh, which is what leads to our next part, the advanced part of this video. Number five, prediction. CP recognition means corner permutation recognition. So what that means is when you get any OLL case, you should be able to look at just three corner stickers. Make sure you pick three that you can recognize consistently. Uh, for this OLL, for example, I will pick this one, this one, and this one, and see what it looks like. And then memorize that for this case, and when we have these two are the same, and this one is opposite, like green and blue are opposite colors, then when you do the OLL, you're going to get the solved corners case. So um, that means it could only be one of these PLLs. Then you also want to memorize what it looks like if you're going to get the diagonal corner swap. So these two are the same, and this one is the opposite one. So this one gives diagonal corner swap, which can only be these PLLs. Then if you get a case where it's not either of those, then you know it's going to be one of the remaining PLLs, which can be any of these. So here's how this helps with PLL recognition. Here I know I'm going to get a diagonal swap, and so I see this four checker pattern in the middle, which I talked about earlier. And this could either be V perm or F perm. And since I know this is a diagonal corner swap, it must be a V perm, not an F perm. Now in this case, I know that I must be getting an adjacent corner swap, which means it can't be like a V perm. I do the algorithm and I see that four checker pattern in the middle, but it's an adjacent corner swap, so there's the F perm. So sometimes people ask me, how do you know if it's going to be a V perm or an A perm? These two on the outsides are different, and these two on the outsides are the same. Or instead, if you see a block, you could just use the corner permutation recognition to be able to tell which one it is. So for example, if they both came from this OLL, then I can see that if these two match, and this one is adjacent, as in it's not like the opposite color of these, it's not orange, then I know this is going to give a diagonal corner swap. So I do the algorithm, and then I get a V perm. I just have to look at the block and I know it cannot be an A perm because it has a diagonal corner swap. It must be a V perm. So now for this case, I recognize that this, this, and this do not make the solved corners pattern or the diagonal corner swap pattern. So it must be an adjacent corner swap. So once I do the algorithm and I see a block, so it's an A perm. So for a case like this, if you recognize the corner permutation from this, this, and this, you can see that we're going to get a corners skip case. And as many of you might know just from experience, if you see this block and this block here, then it could skip PLL. Just from knowing PLL skips is not going to be that useful to you. It is useful, of course, but um, just knowing that it's going to skip and what you have to do afterwards is not all you can get from this idea. Number six, preserved pieces. What you can actually get from this idea is that recognizing PLL may only take looking at one sticker, which can save a lot of time for recognition, and may even get you the world record single by 0.01 seconds. So yep, Felix actually used this idea in his former world record of 4.73 seconds. So here's how it works. This particular OLL is really good because it preserves certain blocks. This block here is going to move to the back, this block here is going to move over to the front, and this block here is going to move over to the right side. So if you know that, then and you just see like maybe just one block, you can predict where that's going to go. So starting with the first case here, uh, I can see from the corner permutation, actually from all of them, that we're going to skip all of the corners. So that means we're going to get a U perm, H perm, Z perm, or so on. And so from this one, I see a block here. Now if you skip all the corners and you have one block, you know it's going to be a U perm, um, because it can't be H or Z perm, those ones don't have blocks. So in this case, I can predict that this one is going to move right over here. So I know that once I do the OLL, I really only have to look in one place to know what exact U perm this is, and that is what's coming over here. And once I see that these are adjacent, then I can go straight into the PLL. 
And a similar idea, we'll use it on this one. So here, no blocks up here, but we have a block over here. And we know that this block is going to come over here. So I'm going to pay attention to what's showing up at the front. And then this is the adjacent one. And then now I know exactly what PL is, this is going to be. This block was predicted. And just as I do this AUF, I can look there. Now for this last case, we know that this one here is going to go to the back. So when we do the OLL, we just look here, that's adjacent, and then we can go straight into the PLL. Okay, I did the wrong PLL, but you get the point. Another way you can use this idea is for other OLLs that preserve blocks. It may not always be the same type of block, but for example, for this OLL, it preserves this 2x2 two two block right here. And I have an entire video on this if you want to learn more one look glass layer tricks, or just tricks in general like this that can save you a lot of time for recognition. Number seven, algorithms for different angles. Learning algorithms from different angles can be useful for a couple of reasons. Now, just a disclaimer, I personally don't really do this that often. There are only a few algorithms that I will actually do different angles for, but here's the general reason of why it can be useful. So here is a G perm, uh, with block is back here, and the algorithm that I use for this goes like this. Note the regrip in the beginning. Now here's the same G perm, but from the opposite side, so this time the block's at the front. And here's the algorithm that I use, again, there's a regroup in the beginning. So both of these algorithms are very good, I would say about equally fast. And so what's the difference? Like, why would I not just do U2 and then go straight into the algorithm versus knowing two different algorithms for the same case? Well, one reason it can be worth it is if I get the case from here. So if I see the G perm from here and I need to do the fastest G perm possible, if I do U prime and then regrip, that's a pause. And if I do U while regripping, that's actually faster. So U prime with regrip goes like this. So there was that pause in the beginning. But if I did U while regripping, it goes like this. So there's no pause between the AUF and going straight into the algorithm. So I find that this is typically most useful for algorithms that begin with a regrip. All right, so that's it. And of course, if you want to learn more, you can check out links in the description or links coming up on the end screen. So as always, I wanna thank my awesome patrons on Patreon. And if you wanna help support this channel and also get the rewards there and help see more frequent videos on this channel, then please consider supporting me on Patreon and I'll be super thankful for that. Thank you guys for watching and I'll see you guys all next time.